It is a privilege and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. Amen. Before I begin my remarks, I want to warn you that what I'm going to share with you from Scripture is a very controversial topic. It was controversial in Jesus' day, it was controversial in the Apostle Paul's day, and unfortunately today it is one of the most controversial topics in the Christian world, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Whenever the Apostle Paul preached on this topic, the Jews, the Bible calls them the Judaizers, did two things to the Apostle Paul. Number one, they would run him out of town and try to stone him to death. The second thing is that they would, he, they would return to the people that the Apostle Paul had been ministering to, the Gentiles, and they would say two things to the Gentiles. If you Gentiles want to be saved, all of the men must be circumcised. And number two, all of you must focus your lives on commandment keeping and good works. Whenever the Apostle Paul preached on this topic, this is the response that he faced from some of the most knowledgeable people in the Scriptures, the Jews. And this is why the Apostle Paul spends all of chapter 4 in Romans defending the biblical fact that we are justified by faith and not by commandment keeping, good works, and in those days, circumcision. Amen. Please do not misunderstand what I'm saying. Jesus and the Apostle Paul are not against good works and commandment keeping as a standard of Christian living. But whenever anyone taught that circumcision, commandment keeping, and good works was a means of salvation or earning justification by faith, then the Apostle Paul attacks them vigorously as he does in Acts chapter 15. Well, whether you agree with me or not in what I'm going to share with you this morning, I hope that you will treat me more kindly after the service <laughs> than the Jews treated Apostle Paul when he preached on this topic. Amen. Whenever God inspires a writer to record something, should you and I take notice that as far as God is concerned, this topic is important. Amen. But when God inspires a writer to say the same thing five times in one sentence, should you and I take notice that this is not only important, but God wants for us to clearly understand this topic, make it a reality in our lives so that we can share it with others as God opens the opportunity for us to do so. Is that a reasonable assumption? Amen. Amen. In Galatians chapter 2, a very, very important event is recorded. This event took place in the city Antioch is about 310 miles north of Jerusalem. And this event is important because some very interesting people are at this event. Number one, the Apostle Paul is there. Number two, Barnabas, Paul's associate evangelist. Number three, the Apostle Peter. In addition to these three important individuals, there is a <coughs> gathering of converted Jew, uh, Gentiles to Christianity. And then something very interesting happens. Into this gathering walks a few men sent from Jerusalem by James, Jesus' half-brother. At that time, he would be called the president of the general conference. And the moment that Peter and Barnabas notice these leaders from Jerusalem walk into the room, Peter and Barnabas remove themselves physically from associating with the converted Gentiles to Christianity. 
And Paul doesn't understand what's happening, but then the Holy Spirit illumines Paul's mind to recognize what, why this is happening. So, I want for you to turn to Galatians chapter 2, and I'm going to read one verse to you, which is the Apostle Paul's response to the Apostle Peter. And I want for you to participate with me by counting with the fingers of one hand how many times the Apostle Paul says the same thing in the positive, and how many times he says the same thing in the negative. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. How many times does the Apostle Paul say the same thing in the positive? How many times does he say the same thing in the negative? One, three, three, three times. Three times. Justification by faith, however, is not a theory. Justification by faith brings three blessings. In other words, justification by faith bears fruit. And it bears fruit in a very specific order. And that's what I want to focus our attention on this morning. So, if you forget everything that I say this morning, I won't be offended. All I want for you to remember is three words. The first word is, now. The second word is, continuously. And the third word is, ultimately. What's the first word? Yeah. Second word? Yeah. Third word? Oh, You're a terrific class. <laughs> it is crucial that we understand the specific sequence in which God has ordained for us to experience the three blessings of justification by faith. Because if we mix that order up, we end up with a condition that a friend of mine calls spiritual constipation. And there's nothing sadder than to see a spiritually constipated Christian. They have no peace, no joy, or assurance of salvation. Amen. And the only biblical solution to this dilemma is to understand the specific order in which we experience these three blessings so that they will become a reality in our lives. Where does the Bible teach the three blessings of justification by faith and the specific order in which we experience them. As I mentioned earlier, Paul, in chapter 4 of Romans, defends the biblical truth that we are justified by faith and not by works. Now in chapter 5, Paul summarizes everything that he said in chapter 4. So I want for you to turn from Galatians chapter 2 to the left, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. When you're there, say ready, and I'll begin reading. Ready. ready. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, that's a summarizing word. He's going to summarize everything that he said in chapter 4 of Romans. Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What tense is having been? Past, present, or future? Past. Past. We have peace with God. What tense is we have peace with God? Present. What's the first word I ask you to remember? Now. The moment that you accept Christ as your Savior you experience the first blessing of justification by faith. Another way of describing justification by faith is you choosing to hide under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is justification by faith. The first blessing of justification by faith then is peace with God. Now, in my case, 
There are a lot of things in this life that I have no peace with. I'm related by blood to some people that I've never had any peace with. I've had neighbors in my lifetime that I had no peace with. There's an agency of the federal government that I need to deal with by the 15th of April of every year that I've never had any peace with. But the peace that the Apostle Paul is writing about here is peace with God. Amen. Did Jesus have peace with his brothers and sisters after he began his earthly ministry? No. Right. They frequently were giving him advice as to what group of the Jewish population he needed to focus his attention on. Did Jesus have peace with the religious leaders of his day? No. No? They crucified him. But did Jesus have peace with God? Yes. And so can you. And don't you let anyone or any situation take that peace away from you. If you have peace with God, the first blessing of justification by faith, you can tolerate anything in this world. Amen. The moment that you accept Christ as a complete and perfect Redeemer, and like one writer says, hiding in Christ, your status or your standing changes with God. You know why? Because God is the one that is faithful. Amen. And God's faithfulness is not based on your and my performance, Amen. but on His unconditional love for each one of us. Amen. Romans 8, 35-39. Time does not permit me to go through all of these scriptures and read them to you. So, if you're interested, make a note and you can read it later. When we step under the umbrella of justification by faith or hiding in Christ, God no longer looks at us as we are. But He sees us as we are in whom? Christ. In Christ. In Christ, we stand perfect and complete in spite of the fact that our life is an up and down experience. What does it mean to experience peace with God? Paul tells us in Romans 8.1, there is, what's the first word I have to remember? No, no. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation, not because we are good, yes. but because in Christ the law was fully established. Amen. Jesus himself tells us in John 5, 24. And I'm paraphrasing for you. John 5, 24. The moment that you accept Christ as your Redeemer, your status changes from death to eternal life, or from condemnation to justification, Amen. which is what we're studying this morning. Do you know what the word peace means in the original language in which the New Testament was written, the Greek language? It means set at one again with God. Set at one again. United again. Do you know how the word peace is spelled in the Greek language? E-I-R-E-N-E. -E -E, pronounced Irene. Some parents name their daughters Irene. It is a sad experience when you see Christians, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, that are not experiencing the first blessing of justification by faith. The reason is because these people are focused on blessing number three, the glory of God, in order to experience blessing number one. God has not ordained it that way. It is impossible to experience the third blessing of justification by faith before first having experienced the first blessing, which is peace with God. So, what is our source? What is the source of our peace? The last part of verse 1 says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through His doing. Through His dying. So, let's see how well we have understood what we've covered so far. Here's a one question quiz for you. Does God begin your relationship with Him by making you perfect in performance and then and only then declaring you righteous? Or... Does God begin your relationship with Him by giving you His peace 
declaring you righteous, and then as you learn to abide in Him, He makes you perfect in performance. Amen. The answer is found in Genesis 15, 5 and 6. In Genesis 15, 5 and 6, God is giving a vision to Abram. This vision happens at night. And God asks Abram, I want for you to leave your tent and go outside and look at the sky and I want for you to count how many stars are up there. Because I want to visually demonstrate to you how large a family I'm going to bless you, 83-year-old man, and your 73-year-old wife with. What did Abram say? I believe you. Amen. What did God say? I declare you righteous. Amen. Did that make Abram righteous in performance from then on? No. According to Genesis 20, verses 2 through 9, we find Abram and all of his family and possessions sojourning in the land of King Abimelech. And now, Abram has what I call a spiritual hiccup. And he says to his wife, if King Abimelech finds out that you and I are married, he's going to kill me and take you as his wife. So I want for you to say to everyone that we are brothers and sisters. What kind of a chaos did that create? Horrible. God does not begin our relationship with him by making us perfect and then declaring us righteous. He begins our relationship with Him by giving us His peace. Again, as we learn to abide in Christ or hide in Christ, then He makes us perfect in performance. And until you and I are experiencing the first blessing of justification by faith, which is peace with God, you and I are kidding ourselves that we are God's commandment-keeping people. Because every scripture in the Bible, the New Testament specifically, that talks about commandment-keeping and good works is set in the context of peace. What is the opposite of peace? Fear. As long as you and I choose to hide under the umbrella of justification by faith, we are guaranteed to experience God's peace. Let's take a look at the second blessing of justification by faith. It's found in the first half of Romans chapter 5, verse 2. First half of Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. What's the second word I ask you to remember? Continuously. Continuously. As long as we are abiding in Christ by choosing to hide under the umbrella of justification by faith, God not only blesses us with His peace, but now He pours His grace out upon us. Amen. And how long does this last? Continuously. What does the word grace mean? Did Jesus live a perfect life when he was on this earth? Yes. Yeah, but the question is how? Because he himself tells us in John 5, 19 and John 5, 30 that he of himself can do nothing. Amen. And then in John 14, 10, he makes an incredible statement. He says, I did not even open up, take the initiative to open up my mouth and say anything unless there was the Holy Spirit impressing me to do so. So how do we live the life that God wants for us to experience? That Jesus experienced. The answer is found in Hebrews 2.9 and I will read it to you. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels specifically Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God, He might taste death for everyone. End quote. This grace 
that enabled Jesus to live a perfect life on this earth is now and continuously available to you and me, the believer, who have chosen to live our lives by hiding in Christ. Today we're studying the three blessings of justification by faith in the specific order in which God has ordained for us to experience them. But the gospel is the good news of salvation which needs to be preached to all the world. This goes on the right side? Yeah. It doesn't matter, so it's under your mouth. It's our responsibility to proclaim the gospel to all the world. But the only people that can proclaim the gospel and experience the three blessings of justification by faith are the believers. So if there's anyone here that has not accepted Christ as their Redeemer and has not been baptized, at this point in time, you're not able to experience the three blessings of justification by faith. Not because I say so, but because Jesus says so in Mark 16, the last chapter in Mark, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. I will read it to you. Jesus says to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 16. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved. But he who has not believed shall be condemned. The word grace has two usages in the New Testament. The first usage is the most common one, which is God's loving disposition to you and to me, the sinner. You can find that in uh, Ephesians 1, 7 and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. The second meaning of the word grace is the way that the Apostle Paul is using it here in the first half of Romans chapter 5, verse 2. And it's describing the strength, the power of God available to you and to me, the believer, so that we can live the life that God wants for us to live on this earth and do the things that God wants for us to do on behalf of our church. For example, when God asks you to do something, God does not want for you to rely on your inherent and cultivated talents. No! God wants for you to depend on His strength, His power, in order to do what He has asked you to do. I'm speaking here as an expert. Because a person standing before you and speaking to you right now was born into this world a genetic introvert. And I don't mind saying to you that I have never volunteered to read scripture in front of anybody or offer prayer or teach a Sabbath school class, much less preach a sermon. So if you're having a problem with me personally or the topic that I'm sharing with you, the person to blame is sitting right there. Yeah. Your pastor, he's the one that asked me to take this sermon. When I was a child and people came to visit my parents, I hid under the bed, including my grandparents, whom I loved dearly. So I have learned through the years that when I'm asked to do something, the only response is, yes, yes. by the grace of God. Amen. <laughs> the classic example of the word grace being used to describe the strength and the power of God is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul asks God, not once, but three times, to remove a symbolic thorn from his side. Some people speculate that Apostle Paul had a problem with his vision. Some people speculate 
that he had a speech impediment. We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. What we do know is that the Apostle Paul was convinced that if God removed the symbolic thorn from his side, the Apostle Paul would be able to be a much more powerful and effective worker for God. In verse 9, God responds to his three requests. Notice the synonymous use of the word grace and power. God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you because power is perfected in weakness. So the weaker I am, the more who shines through. And that's what this is all about. When all of us have this attitude, when we're asked to do something, whether it's holding an office in the church or participating in an outreach activity in the community, our response must be, yes, by the grace of God. When all of us have this attitude, then and only then will this thing that we call the work be completed. Because then God will have a people that are focused on Him, His strength and power, and not us. Amen. And the classic illustration in the Bible about what I'm sharing with you right now, regarding the strength and the power of God to do whatever it is that God asks us to do, is Jesus' experience with His 12 disciples. Jesus trained 12 men to prepare them to take over the work when he left for approximately three, three and a half years. What does a teacher do when a class completes the course? He has a graduation service. The Bible calls it the Last Supper. We call it the communion service. But as Jesus is beginning the activities of the Last Supper, he recognizes that there's a major problem. And the problem is that his class of 12 is arguing among themselves as to who is going to be the greatest in a kingdom which they still perceive as being an earthly kingdom. So, Jesus is forced to change his plans. And he gives one student an F minus. <laughs> And the other 11, he gives them an incomplete. But 50 days after the ascension of Jesus, we have these 11 men now focused on experiencing the strength and the power of God which was poured out on them on the day of Pentecost. Amen. And now that they're focused on the strength and power of God, what kind of results that, they, that the Holy Spirit produced in their lives. Acts 17, verse 6 says, these 11 men turned the world upside down. Amen. Now that we're experiencing the peace of God and continuously standing in the strength and the power of God, what should our goal be in life? The second half of verse 2 of Romans 5 of our scripture. Let me read it to you. We exult in the hope of arriving. What's the third word I ask you to remember? Ultimately at the glory of God. The third blessing of justification by faith. Some people think that the glory of God is when Jesus comes back the second time and this corruption puts on incorruption, and this mortal puts on immortality. That will be a wonderful day. Amen. But here we have another word in the Greek language that has more than one meaning. The Apostle Paul is using the word glory here in the second half of Romans 5.2 the same way that the Apostle John used it in John 1.14, a passage that all of you will recognize the moment that I start quoting it to you. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His what? Glory. glory. Again, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What does the word glory mean?
morning is speaking of the character of God, which God guarantees if we have first experienced the first blessing of justification by faith, peace with God, then His strength, then His glory. What is the character of God? God's agape love that is never focused on self, but always focused outward on others. As the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 